On this week's Vaticano, the monarchs of two nations visit Pope Francis. During his Sunday Angelus, he distributes pocket gospels at St. Peter's Square. We also follow him on a parish visit in Rome. The history of the Bible is put on display at the Vatican. Also, preparations are being made for the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, and these people gather in Rome to discuss the beauty of creation. We take a peek into the Vatican's own mosaic studio, and a Chinese priest who spent 30 years in a prison camp speaks of his joy. All this plus this week's passion relic, the Holy Stairs, coming up on Vaticano. In just a few days, Pope Francis has received the visit of two monarchs, Queen Elizabeth of England on April 3rd and King Abdullah of Jordan on April 7th. During the Queen's visit, the Pope gave her a copy of the original decree adding St. Edward's feast day to the liturgical calendar. He also gave her a blue stone with a cross on top for her newborn grandson, Prince George. The Queen, accompanied by her 92-year-old husband, gave Pope Francis in return a basket of foods and drinks produced in their estates. This included a bottle of whiskey and a jar of honey from Buckingham Palace. When she parted, Pope Francis asked her to pray for him. King Abdullah also visited the pontiff, accompanied by his special advisor and personal envoy, Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed. The visit took place in context of the expected trip of the pope to the Holy Land. April 7th also marked 20 years since the Hutus massacred the Tutsi in Rwanda over a period of 100 days. Just days earlier, the country's bishops visited Pope Francis for a periodic visit. Then, during his Sunday Angelus, Pope Francis distributed gospels to the thousands of pilgrims gathered at St. Peter's Square. During the past Sundays, I have suggested to all of you to get a little book of the Gospels, to carry with you during the day, and to read it often. Then I thought about the ancient tradition of the Church during Lent to deliver the Gospel to the catechumens, to those preparing for baptism. So today, I want to offer those of you here in the square but as a sign for everyone, a pocket-sized book of the Gospels. It will be distributed to you freely. There are places in the square for this distribution. I can see it there, and there, and there. Go to those places and take a Gospel. Take it, carry it with you, and read it every day. It is Jesus who speaks to you there. It is the Word of Jesus. This is the word of Jesus. His angel's reflection focused on Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. The act of Jesus raising Lazarus shows how far the power of God's grace can go, and thus how far our conversion and our change can go. But listen well. There is no limit to God's mercy offered to everyone. There is no limit to the divine mercy offered to everyone. Remember this sentence well. And we can all say it together. There is no limit to the divine mercy offered to everyone. Let us say it together. There is no limit to the divine mercy offered to everyone. The Lord is always ready to raise the tombstone of our sins that separate us from Him, the light of the living. Pope Francis has visited several parishes in Rome since becoming elected. The latest was San Gregorio Magno on Sunday, April 6. During his three-hour visit, he met with young people on a soccer field, then with engaged couples and families who have recently baptized their children. The pontiff also offered confession to several people and presided over Mass. Tutti noi abbiamo dentro. We all have inside of us some parts of our hearts that are not living, that are a bit dead. And some people have so many parts of the heart that are dead. 
a true spiritual cemetery. And when we are in this situation, we realize it. We want to get out, but we cannot. Only the power of Jesus, the power of Jesus, is capable of helping us to come out of this dead part of our hearts, this tomb of sin that we all have. Today, I invite you to think now for a moment in silence. Where is this cemetery inside me? Where is the dead part of my soul? Where is my grave? Think for a minute, everyone, in silence. Let us think. What is that part of the heart that can be bribed because it is attached to sins or to sin or to any sin? And remove that stone. Remove the stone of shame and let the Lord tell us, as he said to Lazarus, Come forth, may all our soul be healed, be resurrected by the love of Jesus, through the power of Jesus. He is able to forgive us. We all are in need of it, everyone. We are all sinners, but we need to be careful and not become corrupt. We are sinners, but he forgives us. We hear that voice of Jesus, that with the power of God tells us, come forth, come out of that tomb that you have inside of you. Come out. I give you life. I make you happy. I bless you. I want you for me. Io ti benedico. Io ti voglio per me. The Vatican's exhibition space in St. Peter's Colonnade now has the history of the Bible on display. God's Word Goes Out to the Nations is being offered now, co-sponsored by the American Bible Society. From real pieces of the Dead Sea Scrolls and some of the first known gospel texts, the visitor is taken through time and space following the spread of the Bible throughout the world. Greece, Egypt, Europe, and medieval times. This scroll brought by missionaries to China, handwritten and illustrated Bibles, all unique, most originals. The message spread in every language with the help of ever-changing technologies. So this year, with all the special events that are going on between now and June, uh, the belief is that uh, well over 100,000 people will come through and see this exhibit. It's free which means that many people who will not necessarily go into a church will come into this exhibit and they get to see for the first time, in many cases, uh, God's Word and in many, their own language, which is quite unique. This is a micro-Bible taken to the moon by Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell in 1971. Yet the Bible has never had as much reach as it does today. Organizers were at the Vatican this week to launch the display. It shows that uh, the transmission of God's Word is real. It shows the, the amazing impact of the Bible. The, we have a section in there on China, how God's Word went into China through the Jews, which is a very unusual story. But in Ecuador, that one of the most violent societies ever to be on earth, uh, and this was a secular anthropologist, the only thing that changed in that society was the introduction of the Bible, and it totally changed them change those people. And so it's, uh, God's Word is alive and well, and that's what you see in this exhibit, is the, mighty, the power of it. And uh, that's what we hope to show. It's not only the transmission of the Word, but the impact of the Word. Stay with us after the break, find out what Pope Francis says during his weekly general audience, and Vatican prepares for the World Meeting of Families. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. The World Meeting of Families will take place in Philadelphia with Pope Francis from the 22nd to the 27th of September 2015. A delegation from the city, led by Archbishop Charles Chaput, was in Rome to launch the initiative along with the Pontifical Council for the Family. They've got great hopes for the encounter. We want to fo focus on these things. The importance, the beauty, 
and the joy of family life, not just its problems. We want to be practical, of course, and realistic, but family is a gift, and we want to acknowledge that gift from God. And to that purpose, we're bringing together the best experts we can, we can enlist to, to address the pastoral, social, economic, and cultural challenges that families now face. We want it to be a gathering not only of Catholics, but of Christians and uh, other people, religious and not, who want to focus on the importance of family. In the end, our goal is simple. We want to help families strengthen their family life in very practical ways. And so I'd ask everyone here, first of all, to pray that God will guide our efforts in a way that benefits his people and proves worthy of the families and communities that uh, we serve. And I hope all of us work together to make this a truly international family gathering that uh, is effective in giving glory to God and serving the, brighter, the wider community. I think it is important for the family to rediscover the importance, the importance of the us, to be in community. Because unfortunately, the atmosphere, the culture, is, uh, is pushing all over the world to be alone. That's why it is important to give a, a more strength to the family in order to help the church the other communities, the society, to become a really with a dream of a common future. Because the individualistic conception is really dangerous for the uh, human being and for uh, our society. In the sense, the, uh, the family matter is not a Catholic matter only. It's a society matter. We need to be careful about family to help them in order to support a good future for the church and for society too. The delegation from Pennsylvania also met with Pope Francis in person to invite him to attend. During his weekly general audience, Pope Francis spoke to the thousands present about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters, we begin today a new series of catechesis dedicated to the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. The first gift is that of wisdom. This is not the fruit of knowledge and human experience, but consists of an interior light that only the Holy Spirit can give and that enables us to recognize the imprint of God in our lives and history. This wisdom is born out of intimacy with God and makes a Christian contemplative. Everything speaks of God and everything is seen as a sign of His love and a reason to give thanks. This does not mean that Christians have a response for everything, but that they have a taste and a flavor of God, so that in their hearts and in their lives, everything speaks of God. Also, we need to ask ourselves if our lives have the flavor of the gospel, if others perceive that we are men and women of God, if it is the Holy Spirit that moves our lives, or if our ideas and intentions are changing. What is important is that our communities have Christians who are docile to the Holy Spirit and who have experienced the things of God and have communicated His tenderness and love to others. In preparation for this year's Synod of the Family, the Pontifical Council for the Family sponsored a day of reflection alongside the Green Accord organization. Its focus was on the family as the custodian of the created world. We think it is important to link the topic of the family with safeguarding creation, 
from two perspectives. The first one is to help people understand that the family is responsible for safeguarding creation. That is, being attentive to a proper respect for creation, to not destroy, to not waste, to not ruin the environment that surrounds us. And because of all of this, obviously creation offers something in return to the family itself. So in this sense, if we say that the family safeguards creation, we can also say that creation safeguards the family. So without a doubt, the family is a school for learning this truth. This is certain. The second perspective is that of indicating that the safeguarding of creation is not an abstract or theoretical concept, but that it immediately requires a new lifestyle. I would encourage, for example, a more sober way of life, and one that is more attentive to the values of solidarity, and that is respectful towards life, not only for now, but for the generations to come. Unfortunately, today, what I would call a dictatorship of the market also attacks the family. So society, or the market, instead of safeguarding the family, all too often takes advantage of it. Oh, there's a lot of things the average family can do to uh, play a role in preserving creation. Uh, and there are many, many activities one could undertake. Uh, I could imagine, for example, uh, uh, having during Lent a carbon fast um, so that we are fasting in, in the sense that we're using less carbon, we're driving less, we're using electricity less uh, as a way to sort of uh, minimize our impact on the climate. Um, we could plant a garden. Uh, and these are activities that are good not just for the environment but also for strengthening the family so that if you're planting a garden and you're getting the kids involved and they're learning about the importance of soil health and the insects and the worms that live in the soil and how that relates to you know, a, a plentiful crop that comes out of the garden and that, that in turn relates to our own health. And it's a wonderful way to bring the family together and almost without realizing it uh, care for creation. The Pope will be convening over 150 bishops and experts for two weeks to discuss and address issues facing the family today, this October. Stay with us after the break. We take a look inside the Vatican's own mosaic studio, and this Chinese priest survives a labor camp. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Few know that within the Vatican there's a laboratory for artists in service to the Pope. Besides St. Peter's Basilica is this workshop, a mosaic studio. Using a mix of centuries-old techniques and modern technology, they create and restore unique works of art. First of all, we make mosaics for the Holy Father because in official occasions, uh, official travels, the, uh, the Pope uh, bring as official gift our mosaics. We do mosaics for private collectors and uh, we do mosaic restorations inside the Basilica of St. Peter. The artists here are also the authors of these official portraits, the Popes themselves in the Roman Basilica St. Paul outside the walls. The official portrait of Pope Francis, of course, was very important for us. In this case, we worked in team. There was a mosaicist who created the, 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 the gilded background, another person who made the body of, of the Pope, and a third person who made the most difficult part of the work, a portrait. And uh, working in team, it was possible to create um, the working time. A Chinese priest was arrested and sentenced to a labor camp for 10 years for belonging to the Legion of Mary. Two of those years he spent it alongside his bishop, who was also in the camp with him. I was in a labor camp in 1958, 
While I was in the labor camp in 1958, we made, uh, you know, in China, the so-called big jump. So he was with me, I was with him in the same factory until the next year. So he taught my mother. We worked 16 hours a day, and after that we heard a whistle. We had no appetite to eat. We would fall asleep, we were too tired. We heard a whistle, we would get up, we heard a whistle, we would eat. We didn't have a watch. We never had the time. We would just follow the whistle. This was not very long, only one or two years. Not very long, only one or two years. He was arrested in his early 20s. This is how it all began. When I was uh, 20 years When I was 20 years old, that's in China, I entered the seminary. In 1955, I was 23. One night on the feast of Our Lady's birthday, a person entered the seminary and arrested priests, teachers, and seminarians. My crime was the Legion of Mary. I joined the Legion of Mary when I was in high school. So this was my crime and they arrested me for it. The first time they sent me in for five years, it was to do labor, to make bricks and to dig the earth. And then years later, there was a new Chinese president and they changed the policy. A little more lenient, the court took us back. The first time without a judge, without a lawyer, I was sentenced. So no judge and no lawyer, just a paper. So I stayed in a labor camp in China, but there was a seminarian in the same group. So after the labor, we would pray the rosary together. But he sent me a letter saying, we must pray for the Pope, be loyal to God, never compromising our faith. I put it under my pillow and an official found it and sentenced me to another seven years. So my total sentence was 10 years, three plus seven. They sent me to the Qinghai province next to Tibet. Everybody knows Tibet. Nobody knows Qinghai province. It's a very cold place. There was a penal farm there. And unfortunately, during these years, there was a great famine in China for three years. So we had nothing to eat. And my health decreased and decreased until I was only 81 pounds and I could not walk without saying work. But now things have changed a little bit for Catholics in China. Even this time, our bishop died. The government Even this time, our bishop died. The government gave us two days for the funeral. But years ago, it maybe would have been impossible. So we're happy, you know. Anyway, we can negotiate with officials, but years ago, we could not negotiate. Only what they would say, we would follow. But years ago, we could not negotiate. Only what he said, we follow. heard about the column of the scourging, the crown of thorns, the cross of the Lord, and the nails of Christ. This week, Father Bernardo Estrada tells us about the holy stairs. That's a mystery. We are not sure, yeah? especially about the authenticity of that Scala Santa. But anyway, it's a big place of pilgrimage and then also the stains that you have of blood in the different steps. So they say that was translated yeah, by, by ship from uh, Middle East to Rome. But I don't have yeah, a very good information about the Scala Santa. But anyway, it's a, it's a place, yeah, the big veneration that has uh, is not indifferent for that. 